All right, everyone. Uh, five minutes. Let's, let's all let's all kind of make our ways to our seats. Uh, thank you all for coming. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes. So I'd like to ask, to ask everyone to please make your way to your seats. No, we have one mic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we're all very, very, very excited to share with you the teams that have been working super, super hard in the last four months here in our lab downtown, uh, just a few blocks away. And uh, this is a big day for them. And uh, this is hopefully a big day for all of you as well. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited and I hope in 10 years time, we'll be able to look back on this day and and say there was a turning point uh, made. And I actually believe that, uh, given the types of teams that you're gonna see and the kind of results that you're gonna see, I'm, I'm pretty confident um, that this will be important. So first, before we uh, go ahead and get started, is everyone, you know, I, I know we have some, some standing room. We also have an anteroom over there where it's being simulcast. So if you get a little bit tired of standing, um, please go ahead and go over there. You know, we also have a simulcast over the Revolution um, workspace uh, at the lab, and I know there are some people over there as well. So I'm thrilled at the, at the turnout. I'm thrilled at the interest in biology as a technology. Um, so before we go ahead and get started, uh, I'd like to just give a, a very brief uh, bit of context and background on where we're coming from and why we're doing uh, IndieBio. What, what does this all mean? So I think... The first and most important thing to remember is that biology is actually the most powerful technology ever created. Uh, when you really think about it, it's like the ones and zeros, but of life, right? And so when you, th when you can see DNA as software, proteins as hardware, and cells as factories, you're able to start thinking about a paradigm in which we could reprogram life to do things for us, and solve completely intractable problems. Problems that have no other technology that can solve for. So, like chicken uh, egg whites without the chicken, uh, to be able to reduce the energy cost of the production of egg whites. We've seen all sorts of different types of paradigms uh, be solved. And it's important because the world has a huge number of trillion dollar problems that are waiting to be solved. And again, with biology is the only technology that's able to do that. And it's important uh, that we do that because right now there's a great opportunity for a huge number of scientists that have spent their life building a new technology, creating an insight, and, and using creativity and drive to build something new. But they don't necessarily have a place to go and build that. Right? They go do a professorship and their IP is locked into the uh, university. Or that's if they get lucky enough to get a professorship. There's a huge abundance of extremely talented and driven people. And so IndieBio was created to give them a path to entrepreneurship and to be able to build what they dream of. And what they dream of is often businesses that can solve huge problems for humanity. And the interesting thing here is the speed at which biology is getting cheaper, the speed at which biology is increasing, and going, being able to get to market in as little as four months is just remarkable. And we're starting to show and prove that you really can build a biotech startup for under $200,000. This was absolutely unheard of uh, just a couple years ago. So we continue to learn. We continue to refine our approach by, with every single batch. And I'm excited for the next couple batches and see how this all goes. But first, I'd like to also introduce the team of IndieBio here in SF. Uh, the hustler in chief, Ryan Betancourt. I think most of you guys know Ryan. <laughs> and then the lord of science and the lord of the lab, <laughs> Ron Shigeta. <laughs> yeah. And so they're going to tell you a little bit more about how we get these teams to build remarkable products in so little time by accelerating both the business side and accelerating the science side. So I'll start with Ron. Thanks, Arvind. So, um, obviously, impact science is this, at the heart of everything IndieBio is doing. 
And to in sort of to talk about the trend that Arvind talked about, where we're thinking about translating from research to market in months instead of years, and most of the world still thinks that this is something that happens in years. I'm going to talk about just two aspects, which I'll call science in and science inside. Science in, well, all of the teams that you're going to see today come from all over the place. We have only one and a half of the teams from the Bay Area. The rest of the teams come from five different continents, eight different countries. Uh, their ideas may come from dissertation work that they did, that they've licensed out of the university they worked at. They may have actually come from a drawing at dinner time, and in one case, actually came with, was thought of in the shower. Um, the thing that the teams have in common is that they've gone through this sort of rigorous admissions process that we have, and we understand that they have the skills to work within the environment of IndieBio to actually get this done in real time and make these companies real. Science inside IndieBio centers around the lab that Arvind talked about. We're the only accelerator where people are actually working on their science on site 24-7 during the whole four-month program. Um, and this is a focused and intense environment. Also, just as importantly, they're working on this in an integrated fashion with developing their business. And so I'm going to hand this off to our hustler in chief to talk about how that works. Ryan? Thank you very much, Ron, and great seeing you all. So we'll just flick over. So how do we make breakthrough biotech companies? We partner with our teams. So we start first by looking at the fundamentals. So we look at what's the actual fundamental of your business? Like how do you make your product or ser service 10, 10x better than your competitors. We start by doing the numbers. Then we move over to focusing on the customer. We believe sales solves everything. So that, that's one of our key points. We move the science and the business forward in parallel. And we think that's really what makes companies win. Not only that, we really focus on results, not activity. So what we do is we meet with all of our companies once a week. We ask them what they've achieved. Not what they've done, but what they've achieved. That's critically important because busy work is something that's not effective when you're trying to build a company and accelerate it within four months. And so it's kind of a pressure cooker, but we, we push and we focus on results. Finally, we build companies with a long view. So we're really looking at impacting all of humanity. This is really the aim of the companies we build here. We're not looking to build companies that are made to flip. These are companies that will become bastions in their own industries, and we focus on multiple different verticals to make that happen. Most importantly, speed is safety. One of the things that we look at when we're looking at building uh, companies is how do we make companies that are not only intelligent and strong, but most importantly, adaptable. And so we build biotech companies that way. So I'm delighted now to hand over to our 14 amazing biotech companies. Hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll really enjoy all of these presentations. We've loved working with them and we're incredibly proud of them. So now I'd like to invite Alex from Gelzen. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. My name is Alex Loristani. I'm the CEO of GelZen, and we build food with biology. Molecular biology has a dirty secret, and today I'm going to let all of you in on it. Evolution is sold as the best solution to building with biology, and the business of building with biology is huge. It makes the medicines that we need, the foods that we love, and the products that we use every single day. And today, the core technology of the companies that build with biology is evolution. This is essentially million monkeys typing tech. With sufficient throughput, iteration, and time, one can, once in a while, come up with a masterpiece. So that brings me to the dirty secret. And it's that evolution is not the best solution we can come up with. In fact, evolution, it can be a constraint. And at Gelzen, we asked, if we remove evolution as constraint, can we fundamentally change the way that we build with biology? And today, I'm going to show you that the answer to that question is yes. Nick and I came to IndieBio to build a smart microbial factory with a switch that we could flip to redirect energy from division, which is a metabolically very expensive and essentially selfish process that builds more factories instead of the product that you want them to make, over to production. So you make the valuable product that you want, instead of building two cells out of one. And we did it. We engineered microbes that 
build exactly what you want instead of wasting energy making more cells. And these data show that we can make better than anyone else more of the protein that you want. And that's our technology, it's, it's our unfair advantage and we're using it to build our first product and that's animal-free gelatin. And I wanna tell you how we make gelatin today. You start by growing an entire animal. Then you rip the meat off and separate the scraps, like the skin and the bone. You put the scraps into an acid bath for a month. Then you extract the gelatin and pack it into a litany of products. And this gruesome, slow, inefficient, and increasingly expensive process supports a global industry worth $2 billion today and one that's expected to grow to $3 billion by 2020. That's the problem, and our solution is building gelatin from scratch with our microbial factories. And we're doing that right now. The gummy bear on the screen and the one that I'm holding in my hand here was made by us at IndieBio, and I wanna walk you through how we actually did this. We programmed our microbial factories to make gelatin. Then we brewed it in the lab at IndieBio and purified the protein. And we use it to make this proof of concept product, we're not a gummy bear company, but to show you what you can do when you build food with biology. And building food with biology using this method is a better way of doing things. It's safe, it's sustainable, it's completely animal free, and it's customizable. And we can compete with animal derived gelatin on cost alone. And that last point is worth repeating. We're making a recombinant protein that we can compete with a commodity good gelatin on just the basis of cost itself. That's the value that we see in our product, but we wanted to understand the value that prospective customers saw in what we're making. So we got on the phone and called Ferrara. They're the largest candy manufacturer in the United States. And here's what we learned. Our customers demand customizability. So they can make their iconic products and brand new ones. And what we can do is tune the mechanical properties of the gelatin that we produce to allow them to do that. They demand consistency. And we can de-risk their supply chain by making a material with stable pricing and properties. And of course they want more customers. And by making food with biology instead of animals, you can open large and lucrative markets just by changing the way you make this product. And Ferrara is just the start. The gelatin market is huge and we're gonna own it. In fact, we just signed a letter of intent with one of the largest gelatin consumers in Asia. We design, produce, and deliver designer proteins to our partners, and we're focused on the research, cosmetics, and food industries right now. We're already cost competitive with the research market and the cosmetics market, and soon we'll be delivering proteins to our partners in food, and this isn't a scientific plan. This is something that's happening right now. This is Nick, Gelzen's co-founder and CTO, and if you wanna know what a happy CTO looks like, it's right on the screen. All right, and, and he's delighted because we're driving down the cost curve that I showed you on the previous page. Gelatin is just the first product that we're building here. Biomaterials, industrial enzymes, and biologic drugs, these are all protein-based products that our core technology will be primed to disrupt. And when we've solved the gelatin problem, we're moving on to these. You met me and you saw Nick a couple slides ago, and we built Gelatin with an exceptional team of advisors. The next step for us is scaling up production and delivering designer proteins to our partners. And today we're delighted to announce that we've closed our $2 million seed round to accelerate to that next stage. And if you'd like to talk about partnerships, Series A, or just learn how you build biology, how you build food with biology, come to our booth. Thanks. That works. So, good afternoon. My name is Agavi Osh. I'm the CEO of Koneku, the neurocomputational company. Each and every one of you in this room take paper for granted. 600 years ago, paper was a big deal because it meant for the first time we could store and transmit our information across vast oceans. 60 years ago, with the invention of the microprocessor, we exponentially multiplied that ability. Today, we can transmit gigabytes of information across time zones at an instant. But there's a massive problem afoot. The fundamental physics and Moore's law will not continue. What are we going to do? 
Luckily, inside each and every one of your heads is a solution. The brain. Your brain has more processing power than the most powerful supercomputer on this planet. It can store more information than the entire Library of Congress catalog. What if we could just harness this power and do computation with it? That ability would astronomically outstrip anything our species has ever seen in history. Over the last 15 years, I have walked across five separate countries, picked up three human languages in the process, to learn the principles of how to do this. It comes down to three points. Number one, the ability to structure neurons, like in your head. Number two, the ability to write and read information from singular neurons. And number three, the ability to stabilize that so it can be as rugged as a smartphone in your pocket. On the number one point is structure. We can control with our neuron shell Singular neurons, how they communicate with one another inside this IP pending shell. Underneath those shells, we have a unique patent pending electrode that allows us to read and write information into singular neurons. And lastly, we pack this into the device the size of an iPad. By 2018, this device will be the size of a nickel. In my hand, I hold our first prototype, which was done at IndieBio. This prototype can support 64 neurons. With those 64 neurons, we can already do computation and chemical sensing. We want to move on to 500 neurons next. With that, we can already do driverless cars, automotive applications. With 10,000 neurons, we can do real-time image processing, just like your eyes see. With 100,000 neurons, we can already do robotics with integration of a lot of sensors. And with more than one million neurons, we can give you a computer that will think for itself. Our killer app right now is hijacking the sensory abilities of a bee, which can sense particles up to thousands of a trillion sensitivity, and put this on a drone. The video I'm about to show you shows Koniku for the first time ever driving a drone with spikes from neuron. On the right, you see a drone that has a sweep stage, a six stage, and a target acquisition phase. On the bottom, you see that with increasing spiking frequency, the drone will drive towards a target. This has a lot of applications. At the core of it, our device at the core of it, our device has the Koniku core. This Koniku core contains neurons. That neuron we can sell to different suppliers. That neuron we can sell to different suppliers. We open up our platform to different applications. So we have third-party developers that can add add-ons to our devices, but eventually everybody will come back to us for consumables. Right now, we are, fed, we are squarely focused on the sensor market. This sensor market is worth more than $40 billion. After we conquer this sensor market, we want to move into the control market, which is worth more than $200 billion. From that control market, we can already do cognition, of which there is really no market limit. This is not science fiction. This is happening right now. We already have a letter of intent from AstraZeneca was potentially more than $1 million per year. We signed a letter of intent with Boeing to have our devices on top of their UAVs for chemical threat detection. I am personally very excited to talk to you about the project we have oncoming with Cisco, where we'll be able to transmit sensors from one part of the world to the other. Of course, there are other people trying to do this. But Koniku is 600 million years ahead of the competition. <laughs> Qualcomm, IBM, D-Wave, and Amazon, they are forever limited by Moore's law because 
biology is the most advanced technology. I am supported by a fantastic team. Christina and Chris McAndrew have between them management, supply side, and sales of more than $300 million. And Laura, who comes from Cambridge in England, is from the lab that developed the first stem cells. My advisory board is led by Dr. Alan Jones, the CEO of the Paul Allen Brain Institute, the number one brain research facility on this planet. We are seeking to raise $6.3 million for this project, of which we have circled already more than $2 million as of this afternoon. It's my special privilege to announce our first developer conference. The neurogrammers of the future who are going to program our devices, we invite them to use our platform from the 11th to the 12th of August this year. If you want to change the future, come talk to us. Let's do this together. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Clayton, and I'm the CEO of Genesis DNA, the next generation of gene synthesis. Virtually every experiment in biology begins with the right DNA sequence. But today, outdated and inadequate tools for writing those sequences are choking progress. Take this sample of 580 sequences ordered from services for writing DNA. Over half of them were delayed for weeks to months wasting time and money. But let me emphasize the real cost of this problem, because every one of those sequences was actually a new idea, and every failed synthesis, an idea that we miss out on. These could be microbe-derived plastics and fuels, cancer therapeutics, new paradigms in data storage. In these areas, writing DNA is already a $1 billion market opportunity, and it's the fundamental tool that will help make them a reality. So we have to do better, because at its core, writing DNA has changed very little from a hand-built process first developed in the 70s. That's synthesis 1.0, stitching together a bunch of shorter pieces of DNA to build a full-length product. But this is like soldering a bunch of extremely small electronics by hand with different tools every single time, because different building blocks are used for every sequence, and if you use the wrong building blocks, the synthesis will fail. And today's Synthesis 2.0 isn't much better. It really just runs the same inefficient process in parallel and fails to solve these fundamental problems. So clearly, it's time to move away from hand building and towards something much more like this. Pick and place machines revolutionized electronics with rapid and cost effective board assembly using standardized parts. That's what inspired us, and that's what we built. Genesis DNA is Synthesis 3.0, the world's first pick-and-place machine for DNA synthesis that finally standardizes an unpredictable process. Here's how. We start with a grid of standard DNA parts and a magnetic bead that contains starter strands of DNA. When the bead is at a particular spot on the grid, the DNA on both surfaces interacts, then enzymes in solution extend the DNA on the bead, which then departs from spot A towards spot B for the next extension cycle. Now, here's the magic. By containing standard parts, the same grid can be used for every sequence that we build. And unlike everyone else, we don't do any stitching. Our grid is not consumed in the process of building and can be reused again for the next order. See, that's the pick-and-place advantage. Predictability and reusability means that synthesis can be fully automated at every step along the way, for a significant reduction in cost. At scale, our system will be moving thousands of beads simultaneously and independently for costs at a mere fraction of a cent per base pair. Here's version one of our platform, where you can see a computer-side control algorithm interfacing with magnets to move three micron beads to programmable target positions. And now the best part. It works. It builds DNA. We built short pieces of DNA as proof that pick-and-place can work for DNA synthesis, which brings us one step closer to our vision of the ideal synthesis service. A customer uses our website to order a custom DNA sequence, which is sent to our synthesizer, QC'd, 
packaged and shipped back to the customer with this promise. For every sequence ordered, we promise one price per base pair, one delivery date, no ranges, and no changes, which will make us the only service on the market with industry-leading prices and exact turnaround times, with the ultimate goal of removing synthesis as a bottleneck by offering custom DNA at one cent per base pair, delivered under a week for both simple and complex sequences. This is something that companies today want. We already have eight letters of intent to participate in beta trials when our platform is up and running, and we plan to reach them as quickly as possible. So today, we're working hard to build longer DNA sequences and close a seed round for the development of a full-scale gene synthesis platform by Q2 2017 that's ready for these trials. The revenue from these trials will help us build our multi-bead system and kick off growth into the US market for standard genes. Over the following five years, our increasingly strong product portfolio of libraries and combinatorial gene clusters will make us a world leader in DNA synthesis. By 2020, we want inefficient and unpredictable synthesis to be a thing of the past. We've felt the pains of inadequate synthesis tools firsthand and for too long, so we're determined to do something about it. We are a team of material scientists and bioengineers from MIT and Stanford, with advisors who are world leaders in synthetic biology, who have founded companies that went through billion-dollar IPOs, and who have built and scaled gene synthesis platforms in the past. That makes us the right team for the job. Today, we're raising $1.5 million to build the tool that will build the future of biology. Come meet us at our booth to see our pick-and-place machine in person. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Andrew, CEO of Valley, and today I'm going to be telling you about how our technology is used to cure diseases by reprogramming cells. All of us have seen somebody deal with being treated for cancer. Cancer drugs suck, and my friend Barbara here knows this better than most people. Barbara has been treated by my co-founder, Mike Wong, for stage four metastatic melanoma. Mike has thrown everything he has in his arsenal at trading Barbara, and he has failed to cure her. She's running out of time, she's out of options, and we think that this is unacceptable in the 21st century. So how is it that we failed Barbara so badly? Well, the first problem that everybody is familiar with cancer drugs is how toxic they are, so I'm not gonna dwell on that too much. The second problem is that we really don't have a good way to deliver cancer drugs to tumors. Even if you used an antibody or a nanoparticle delivery system, you're still going to miss some of the time and therefore get toxicity. The third problem is that even if you could target the perfect drug to the tumors perfectly, you wouldn't wipe them all out. There will always be some cells that are resistant and therefore your tumor grows back, now it's drug resistant, and that's exactly what Barbara's facing. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, Valley believes that in the 21st century, drugs aren't used to cure diseases, reprogramming cells is used to cure diseases. In the case of cancer, we would reprogram these cells by flipping a genetic switch that forces the cancer cells to kill themselves. Now, this is a bit like blowing up the Death Star from the inside out. And for that, you need a state-of-the-art delivery system such as the Millennium Falcon. That's what we built at the molecular level. This is Valley's technology. We've developed, for drug delivery, multilamellar liposomes. If you imagine those Russian stacking dolls where you have a doll inside of a doll inside of a doll, this is similar. You have a liposome inside of a liposome inside of a liposome. The advantage of this is that you have multiple compartments in which you can deliver different therapeutics. And this is a very flexible system. You can do this regardless of the chemical characteristics of what you're trying to deliver. So you could, for example, combine an old school small molecule drug with CRISPR-Cas9, or you could deliver an antibody and a DNA molecule. Because of this, we have now developed a system that can reprogram cells in vivo. We're calling our first generation technology ONCODE. This stands for Oncology Recoded. It takes advantage of the fundamental differences in gene expression between cancer cells and healthy cells. ONCODE will be injected into the patient, will travel to tumors, and enter cancer cells. Once they're inside the cancer cells, they'll actually do a genetic spot check 
and really make sure that this is, yes, a cancer cell. If it's a yes, it flips the genetic switch and the cancer cell kills itself. What's really important, though, is that if we end up in a healthy cell, such as a liver, for example, this technology is smart enough to know that. It doesn't flip the switch, and that cell survives. So now you're killing cancer cells, but leaving healthy cells alone. Now, this might sound like science fiction, but in the last few weeks at IndieBio, we have made it science fact. In the top right, in orange, you can see this massive tumor cells sitting on a bed of healthy green cells. With just one treatment with OnCode over 48 hours, we virtually eradicated the cancer cells, as you can see in the bottom right. Now, this is amazing, and it has the fundamental ability to change how we treat cancer forever. But we know that this is a long way from the market. So how are we going to build a viable business to get us there into the clinic? Well, it turns out that even in the 21st century, there are still many, many drugs from many, many companies that literally sit on shelves because they can't be delivered to the right place at the right time and the right patient. Valley is building partnerships to solve those problems. Let me give you a couple of examples. I'm proud to announce that during our time at IndieBio, we not only forged our first partnership with Intelligent Material Solutions, we also delivered our first product in just a few weeks. IMS has an amazing nanoparticle that can actually be imaged on x-rays. The problem was that they couldn't ever deliver it to a living cell. Valley teamed up with IMS to solve this problem, and in doing so, we have developed a nanoparticle that allows tumors to be imaged on a simple x-ray or CT scan for the first time in medicine. Now, this is incredible, and it's a great breakthrough, but it's also something that's very exciting from the business side. With this, just this first product from our first partnership, we have access to three different markets, each of which is worth over $1 billion. And the best part is that we have a 50-50 revenue agreement with IMS. The second partnership is one that I'm really, really excited about. When Merck heard about our ability to deliver two different drugs in the same nanoparticle at the same time to cancer, they called us in 24 hours. Within a couple of days, we had a meeting with them, and now we've, we're working on getting a pilot study started in the next two months. Anybody who's dealt with Big Pharma will tell you that this is moving at lightning speed for these guys. So they're obviously as excited as we are about this possibility. Our business model is quite straightforward. As I've alluded to, we would take a partner's asset and we would encapsulate it in our technology. We'd then show that we can deliver it more effectively and more safely than the drug on its own. For this, Valley would get paid. This would be a paid development project. Once we've developed this, we would hand it back to our partner and they would do the expensive and difficult clinical trials with the FDA. As the new asset moves through these clinical trials, Valley gets paid. We would get paid for each milestone reached. Finally, once the product's on the market, we would get royalties for every sale. Now, we do have some competition, but as far as we know, nobody can do the things we can do in terms of multi-drug delivery and cell reprogramming. Our IP is protected by two different provisional patents, one of which we wholly own because we developed it right here at IndieBio. Our milestones over the course of the next year are to continue to build our stable, uh, our stable of partnerships. We will also develop the team and the production bandwidth to serve those partnerships. Speaking of our team, we've assembled a stellar group of scientists. We have biomedical engineers, material scientists, and cancer biologists, all of whom are laser-focused on making cancer a disease of the past. Of my key advisors, I'd like to point out Holly Hartman. Until recently, Holly was the director of biz dev at Amgen, so she is intimately familiar with getting the kinds of deals done that we need to build to build our successful business. With that, I'll close. And if you want to help join us on our quest to make this a reality in patients, then come and see us at our booth. You'll see a live demo of our, technician, uh, of our technology. We're raising $1 million. We have 300,000 already committed. And I'll see you at the booth. Thank you. I'll wait for the mics, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie, and I'm the CEO of Amino Labs. And today, we want to welcome you to the future of consumer biotech with the Amino Personal Biolab, which you can see in the corner. And 
Today, you'll really realize after hearing all the demos and hopefully tasting a few of them, that bioengineering is the technology that's going to shape the next century in the same way that computer science and electrical engineering shaped our lives. But right now, the barrier to entry to bioengineering for most people is very high. You need to have a lot of large equipment. This equipment is very expensive, so most schools and individuals can't afford it. And also, it's made for expert. You need to be an expert to understand how to use it, but also to understand what you can make with it. And so what we've done is we've miniaturized all this equipment, all the science, all the electronics, into a compact, affordable, playful, and powerful personal biolab. This is easy enough for your kids to understand how to use, but it's powerful enough and sophisticated enough that a professional scientist will get new insight into his research by using it. Nope. The reason we're focusing on making science accessible to non-scientists is that most of us aren't scientists. And um, I'm a designer, and the first time I encountered bioengineering, I was amazed by how powerful and impactful it is in our daily life. But I was really, really inspired by what I could start creating right now from it, from gummy bears to pigments to cosmetics. And that was amazing. And so we've built a team of engineers, and together we've actually developed a whole ecosystem that allows you to bioengineering out of the lab. It's suitable for schools, but it's fun enough to be used at home. And this is the ecosystem. And so you've got the hardware platform, which teaches you how to bioengineer with a set of on-screen instructions and color-coded system. This allows you to assemble all the DNA you need to grow a bioengineered product. You grow the bioengineered product into here, and you use our web app or on-screen data to know how to take care of it as you go forward. You know what to do because we have application-based packets. It has all the ingredients, all the cells, all the DNA you need to be able to bioengineer out of a lab. And so right now, this is the data from a few hours ago for the cherry amino, which is this guy. You can see that was 107 billion population. If you all go to amino.bio slash cherry, you can see the data streaming live. We also have walnut in the corner that's giving us a different color. And right now, I checked before coming on stage, I think it's 220 billion little bacteria is creating for us. What they're creating is actually a new app we're unveiling today called the Amino Artist app. This allows you to grow any color pigments for you to, or your child to paint and draw with. So you can actually use this in your daily life. And it doesn't stop there. We're actually, our second app is a glow app, which allows you to put the DNA of a firefly inside the cells and then have a nightlight in your home or office. From there, we're going to team up with bakeries and breweries to bring you yeast that has been engineered with different flavors, different colors, different uh, vitamin content so that you can bake and brew. You can also make cosmetics, medicines, gummy bears, anti-cancer research. And this actually allows us to have a really simple business model where the hardware platform allows us to have high-profit amino apps that we deliver, either by subscription, renting, frequent upgrades, as well as hardware add-ons in the future. And the reason we know why the world is ready for bioengineering in the home is because not only have we had great coverage from tech journalists, but also from more mainstream media like the Huffington Post. We've won design awards and UNESCO awards, and we've actually been approached and invited to go to the White House Maker Fair, which means that the government actually supports bioengineering in the home. We have development partners to bring Amino to you quicker in terms of education partners, museums, and fab labs. We have um, three pilot programs running in schools from kinder kindergarten up, which means middle schools, high schools, undergrads, and also homeschooling. We've also been invited to worldwide events which will be great because we can spread the word of bioengineering. But most importantly, we've actually had some amazing sales. We sold out our Indiegogo campaign, and we've been approached to produce a 1,000 amino a quarter for next year for a school district in the US. That's only one district. And we've been approached by the Chinese government to supply all the STEM education hardware for their science club and after-school activities. This validates our go-to market strategy, which is basically by entering through education like the personal computer did, we'll make sure that the world is ready to bioengineer in the home before we team up with bakeries and breweries, cosmetics, so on and so forth. And as we do this, right now, we need to meet the high demand of aminos, and that means we're raising 1.5 million so that we can do large-scale manufacturing.
So today you can come and try Amino for yourself. You can see why there's such high demand for it. And also you can start painting with our new app. Thank you. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dominique Barnes. I'm the CEO of New Wave Foods, and we disrupt seafood, not oceans. What's in your fish? If you eat wild-caught fish, you're consuming toxic pollutants, so maybe you reach for farmed fish. Well, then you're consuming a bunch of antibiotics and dyes. The crazy thing is, is the demand for fish is soaring, higher than we can get from our oceans, and fish farming is struggling to fill the gap. But are we going to continue to feed ourselves on antibiotics and toxic pollutants? No, this is time for a revolution in seafood, and that's what brought our team together. I'm a marine conservationist, and I've had 10 years experience witnessing firsthand the decline in our seafood and our oceans. Michelle is a talented material scientist with six years experience, and she's dedicated her talents to making your life better by improving your food. And so we got together and we decided we'd go after the biggest, baddest, dirtiest seafood out there, shrimp. Shrimp is the number one consumed seafood in the US. We import $6.7 billion of it annually, but it embodies all the things that are wrong with our seafood supply chain. Many of the farms in Asia are downstream from pig farms. Children are forced into slavery to process the high volume and it has the highest carbon footprint of any protein on the planet, 10 times higher than that of beef. So what are we gonna do about it? We are engineering a better shrimp. Our te technology allows us to create a superior product without compromising taste and nutrition. We analyze shrimp on a molecular level to understand what gives it its texture, like elasticity. And then we use that information to select natural, sustainable ingredients, and through our proprietary texture technology, we can recreate the high-performing matrix that mimics shrimp. And the beautiful thing about our technology is that it can be applied to any other seafood out there. We can make shrimp or crab, anything that you can think of. Choosing our ingredients is important and also understanding the building blocks of the animal. So this red algae, for example, is the same algae shrimp consume that give it its color and flavor. And we can incorporate this algae into our formulations for the same functions. And it just so happens that this is the highest antioxidant known on the planet, so it's good for you too. So I'm really excited for you guys to be here today so I can reveal to you our shrimp. This is our shrimp. There's no animals here. It's natural, it's consistent, it's nutritious, and it outperforms its ocean counterpart on being versatile, animal-free, and sustainable. So you can see it looks beautiful in a dish, but we wanted to see what people thought of the taste. So we went rogue, Michelle grabbed her iPhone, we threw samples on a plate, and we took it to the food court, and this is what happened. Then we got kicked out of the mall. <laughs> but you can see random people like our product. They said it tastes like shrimp, it tastes good, and they would eat it again. Two weeks ago, I got an email from Chef JP. He's been making the samples there. He works at Google. He's their lead vegan chef. And he said, hey, Google's looking to reduce the amount of shrimp that they serve in their cafes because of all of those sustainability reasons. So Michelle and I whipped up a batch and brought them to the executive chef at Google, and he was shocked with how good the product was and instantly ordered 200 pounds. <laughs> and it's not, it's not just the taste that's selling people on our product, it's because it opens it up to new markets. We're talking with Laheim Sushi. They're excited about our product because Shrimp isn't kosher. Now they can add shrimp to their menus, expanding it with shrimp dumplings, shrimp spring rolls, and it meets their other needs of quality, sustainability, and safety. 
We de-risk their supply chain by providing a consistent product they can always rely on, and it saves them time. They don't have to peel the shrimp or de-vein it. And talking with these chefs is a part of our market disruption strategy. Chefs are key influencers in what we eat and what are on our menus. And what they decide slowly trickles down all the way to the mass market. If you think about sushi, people were very reluctant in the US to consume raw fish, but when chefs got a hold of it, it eventually trickled down, and now you can find it in almost any grocery store. There are other vegan shrimp out there, but we blow them out of the water, not only on taste and texture, but also our nutritional profile. So our product will have the same nutritional components, that of shrimp, all the things that you want, high protein, low fat, but no cholesterol. Once we get to the level that we're on the shelves in the grocery store, we'll be cost competitive with vegan shrimp and real shrimp. But just being a vegan shrimp isn't enough. It is our goal to be on the stores in, or shelves in the grocery stores and next to the real shrimp. In order for us to be a real seafood revolution, we need to replace shrimp for shrimp and make a difference and end what's happening in our seafood supply chain. We have a team of advisors that are leading us on this path. Dr. Peter Diamantis is the founder of the XPRIZE Foundation and Singularity University. We also have experts in branding, food science, and scaling food companies to million dollar exits. Press coverage has been very kind to us. Many of you are here in the audience today. And I think it's really because this resonates with their audience. People are ready for a change. They want something different, and this hasn't been available to them before. So people are ready for the revolution. So join us. We're currently raising our seed round to expand our team with scientists and engineers developing our technology. And I invite you to join us to taste the revolution at our booth. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Nasanov, and I am the CEO of vSense Medical Devices, and we are the future of vital sign monitoring. Right now, it is impossible to continuously gather health information about a patient without tying them to a bed with tens of thousands of dollars of expensive equipment. Right now, uh, the, the equipment is, it gets in the way of the doctor, it is uncomfortable for the patient, and it's also a vector for disease. It's a serious problem. And at and about 50 years ago, we saw a vision in Star Trek of a world where this kind of health information could be monitored uh, as soon as you hit the bed, with nothing attached to you at all. And at vSense Medical Devices, we have turned that into a reality. In fact, this device has been scanning me since I took the stage. Can we switch to the output, please? Great. So there, there you have it. So my heart rate is 92, and my respiratory rate is 17. I'm, I'm pretty excited to be here. Ooh, so is he. So I got involved with this technology uh, in the last few years. I spent five years working at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, and in that time, my children were born, and they required continuous monitoring for the first week of their life. Around the same time, I got introduced to a technology that NASA built that uses ra radar to identify people in a disaster response scenario, such as people under a collapsed building, by looking for human vital signs in, in a field of view. And I instantly became obsessed with bringing this technology to the marketplace. And uh, I started the company, uh, obtained exclu exclusive rights for the technology, joined IndieBio, and we have been working hard ever since to reduce the size of the technology and build a product out of it. So right now, so, so you can see our original device. It was about the size of a suitcase. This is four inches cubed. And in a few months, the device will be the size of an iPhone. So the device measures heart rate, heart rate variability, and respiratory rate. And it does so continuously, and we're able to mine that data to identify clinical events that are patterns of those vital signs. For example, when you have a sleep apnea event, your uh, breathing stops, your heart rate spikes, and, you, um, and then you take a very deep breath, and we measure those things directly. So sleep apnea, body movement, whether a, a, a person has moved. Uh, these are just a few examples of the clinical things that we can identify based on the underlying physical data. And we're working with researchers at Stanford and Cedar sinai to increase the catalog of clinical events. Fundamentally the, fundamentally, the device measures the rise and fall of the chest throughout the breathing cycle. 
And this gets you the information that you can see on the right. You can see that we measure individual breaths, individual heartbeats, variation and timing, variation in timing of the breaths, and, and all of this is cl important clinical information for tracking disease progress and taking care of patients. So the first, speaking of patients, the first market we're approaching is the nursing home market because of the severity of the vital sign monitoring problem in that industry. Nursing home patients suffer because vital sign changes are missed. This happens a lot because nurses are massively overworked and overwhelmed and are sometimes unable to get to each patient on the schedule and manually check their vital signs. It's a huge problem. There are 1.7 million nursing home beds in the United States in almost 16,000 facilities. And even with the $136 billion spent taking care of these people, this information is still missed routinely. And that causes real suffering and illness. But not anymore. Now we monitor and capture that data, enabling intervention before disease strikes or disease progresses. This means that one nurse can now check 20 patients at a time. She can have the information displayed on a screen, or she can save even more time, and that information can be logged directly into the electronic health record. Nurses we've talked to so far think that this will save them hours and hours every day that they can use to actually take care of patients. We have a relatively simple business model, device sales and subscription, a subscription access to the, to the data. We have a total addressable market of about $600 million in device sales in the un United States alone, and uh, that's at a $350 price per device. And at $25 a month per monitored bed, that's $500 million a year of recurring subscription revenue. We're already talking with the largest nursing home chain in the United States, as well as the dominant electronic healthcare record provider, so that we can incorporate our hardware with their software and go into any nursing home on the continent and offer them a compelling solution. That's just nursing homes. We're from nursing homes, we'll expand to the home senior care market, which is an $80 billion market. And we already have a letter of intent with a concierge physician practice that wants to put uh, our device into hundreds of his patients' homes around the world. From there, we'll make a consumer device so we can bring the benefit of this technology to everyone in your family. There is some competition in the continuous vital sign monitoring space, but it is far, far inferior to ours, to our technology. The wearables category requires pe people to wear some combination of sensors and wires on their bodies in different places, and they don't send the information to the nurse. The nurse still has to come to get them. Uh, so it doesn't really save much time, and it isn't really much more comfortable. There are various pad solutions that go under the mattress and measure certain vital signs, but they actually get in the way. They create more work than they solve because they, they get in the way of changing the beds and the patients moving and all of that. That and they've been, uh, they've been priced very high, so they haven't sold well. Only the vSense Sentinel device that you see there continuously monitors patient vital signs without contact at all. So our technology is as safe as a flashlight. Uh, now, we are regulated by the FDA because we're creating information that doctors will use to make care decisions. But we have, as an advisor, the former head of the Office of Device Evaluation at the FDA, and so we're confident that we can get through the process. We have an excited and capable team ready to execute this plan. I spent five years at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab managing advanced technology development. My CTO, Hector, spent 10 years there in the same radar systems development division that would later go on to invent the technology. And our president, Ryan, has a decade and a half of business experience uh, founding, and sell, founding and selling companies and, and the healthcare asset management experience. We're here today to raise $2 million to get to FDA clearance in one year, revenue in 18 months, and thank you for coming. Please come to our table to get your vital signs scanned and experience the future of healthcare. Thank you. Hi, I'm Evelyn Chan, CEO of NER Skincare. We are a data-driven beauty company. Skincare problems affect all of us. Bad skin can make us less confident. Current state of our treatment of the skin are based on decades of science. But every 20 years, a new technology has been adopted by the beauty industry. Those innovators become leaders and go on to dominate the market for years. 
we believe the skin microbiome science is the next big thing in beauty. Here's why. There are 10 times more bacterial cells than human cells in your body. From the Human Microbiome Project, initiated by the NIH, we now know that bacteria are highly associated with our health, and they're part of our physiology. And we started with the most common microbiome cause problem, acne. There are 40 million acne population in the States. They are spending more than $2 billion on this problem. Based on our projection, we'll bring in more than $10 million in revenue by 2018. Who are we competing against? All current acne treatment contain benzoyl peroxide or salicylic acid. They are harsh chemicals. They are known for making your skin dry and sensitive. We need to stop sacrificing your health for beauty, and we have a solution. Our proprietary molecules can make bacteria improve your skin. We started with our first molecule that suppressed the acne-causing bacteria, and there are more future applications to come. For example, there are bacteria that can fix your sunburns, there are bacteria that can actually prompt your own cells to produce more collagens or ceramides, which have anti-aging effects. How does our molecule work? This is an acne. Staph epidermis and P. acnes live in acne lesions. Our compound prom promotes staph epidermis to produce more short-chain fatty acids that actually suppress the acne-causing bacteria and reduce inflammation. We have had a 100% success rate. You notice the difference within seven days? We're able to eliminate 90% of the acne in the first 30 days. But our journey doesn't stop here. This is just our one application of the microbiome approach. This is why we're offering the microbiome test kit to our customers to collect their facial microbiome data. No one has actually collected the facial microbiome data, not even the NIH. Very shortly, we'll own the world's largest facial microbiome database. We're going to use the knowledge to power future formulations. And here's how it is. In cosmetic industry, they never update their formulations. And they're proud of that. This is our iterative development cycle. With the microbiome database, our ingredient library, and customer data, we're able to provide monthly subscriptions of updated formulations that address different cosmetic problems and accommodate different microbiome types. How are we going to sell the products? We've generated $125,000 selling our first products since July. We're awarded a million dollars in research grants from the Taiwanese government. We're happy to announce that we're launching our acne treatment line in March and our microbiome test kit will be in closed beta next month, which will enable us to launch the official product in, in October. Also expecting our first anti-aging line early next year. We're selling our products on Amazon, Birchbox, Anthropology, and on our official website. We're expecting our products to be in high-end retailers and at your doctor's office the following year. We're covered by press and beauty bloggers. We got thousands of great reviews from customers. We know how to create products customers love. We are a team of people with very diverse backgrounds, from aerospace science, bioinformatics, biomedical engineering, economics, to design. We believe we are the right team to reinvent the beauty category. We are raising a $2 million seed round with $1.2 million committed. If you're interested in learning more the bacteria on your face or more microbiome data, come find us at our booth. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is June Axif. I'm the co-founder of MyEye, which stands for My Information. 
We are developing the next generation of protein detection technology to empower data-driven biomedical discovery. We are in the age of genomics, which has unleashed an unprecedented amount of information about the human body. This has also brought us into the age of omics, where we are no longer looking at single genes, but the entire genome as a whole. However, DNA information alone is not enough for understanding disease. This is because what actually matters is the proteins made from the DNA. We have the same DNA in every single cell in our body, but it is when and where certain proteins are made that inform us of disease and how we age. Indeed, the majority of therapeutics on the market today target proteins. But the reason why my team is interested in learning about proteins is for patients like Tanner. Tanner had a germline P53 mutation, one of the worst mutations in cancer. Germline means that every single cell in his body was a ticking time bomb to become cancerous. And unfortunately, Tanner passed away from brain cancer. And in his passing, his family created this, this project with the J. Craig Venter Institute and my co-founder, Nicholas Schwark. The project tries to detect cancer at its earliest stages by looking at changes in proteins. This is the type of personalized medicine we want to enable. But to get there, we need to develop the next generation of protein detection technology. So what is the problem? Well, protein detection technology today is cumbersome, extremely expensive, and not sensitive enough. And this is very unlike the recent developments in DNA and sequencing, where DNA, today you can sequence all of one's DNA and RNA very cheaply. Our team realized that the fundamental difference is because DNA and RNA can be replicated by PCR technology, polymerase chain reaction. Proteins cannot be amplified directly. There is no PCR technology for proteins. So our team asks, what if there can be? And that's exactly what we have done. So we can take a molecule that binds proteins, such as an antibody, we can put a DNA tag onto it, and now we can amplify this tag using PCR technology to amplify from one strand into millions, thereby allowing us to detect low amounts of proteins much easier. Additionally, because these tags can be unique barcodes, we can now look at a bunch of different proteins in the same reaction, so thereby making this, this system high throughput and cost effective. So from a single biological sample, we can look at a bunch of different proteins with our cocktail of antibody DNA conjugates. We can collect and then amplify by PCR, and then we can run it on next generation sequencing to determine the identity of the proteins and its concentration in the sample and we can leverage existing next-generation sequencing platforms like, like those of Illumina and Oxford Nanopore. So effectively, we have repurposed all of DNA technology for the use of detecting proteins. And because we're using next-generation sequencing, we can look at DNA, RNA, and proteins at the same time, making collecting all this data very simple. So what is our product? Our first three products are different protein detection panels that look at different types of proteins, and this has a value of $3 billion today. But the true value is in the data that we can generate. So using our panels, we can look at samples from healthy and diseased individuals. We can look at the proteins in the context of DNA and other information, and begin to build this complex relationship map. So this map will finally give us a full picture of a disease and allow us to devise an intervention. This kind of data aggregation is unique to my eye, and our team has the expertise and passion to solve these kinds of problems. So our business model starts with selling protein panels to academia and industry. We generate data to build our my eye map using internal and, our, and through our partnerships. And then we can license this MariI map to other institutions for the development of diagnostics and therapeutics. And because this is a positive feedback loop, our customers are constantly helping us improve our products. Our protein panels initially address a $3 billion market, leading into a $24 billion market. And our MyEye map addresses a $77 billion diagnostic and therapeutics market. 
We have gotten incredible traction and interest through our proof of principle studies, and we are partnering with institutions to develop our panels, such as antibody companies, next generation sequencing companies, and direct users of our kit. Compared to our closest competitors, we differentiate ourselves by leveraging all the next generation sequencing instruments already in laboratories around the world. So with, without having to use specialized equipment, that makes our assays cost effective and adaptable. Additionally, we are the only platform that can look at DNA, RNA, and protein concurrently in the same sample. We have an amazing team that stem from the Scripps Research Institute and the J. Craig Venture Institute, and we are uniquely able to deliver our technology and build our company. We have accomplished scientists in bioinformatics and personalized medicine, Nicholas Schwark and Christopher Nazer. We have experts in bioconjugation and nucleic acid chemistry, Devin Kayer, Reza Gadiri, and myself. And we are joined by a seasoned business officer, Maria Ferrero. We are looking for $1.5 million in seed funding, of which a third has been committed. Join us in unleashing the next wave of biological data. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Paul Feldstein. I'm the CEO of Circularis, where we're helping our customers improve their protein production. Cells are factories, factories that make protein. And those proteins are found everywhere from our laundry detergent, the medicines we take, even in the food we eat. Currently, the protein economy is worth over $350 billion a year, and it's growing. That's huge. So, if cells are factories, promoters are the factory foreman. Here you can see the red factory foreman controlling the cell's protein-making machinery to produce this amount of, our, of this red protein. So let's say we want to make a different protein, a valuable protein, like this green protein. The question is, which factory foreman should we give the job? With our technology, we can essentially interview all the factory foremen in the cell and ask the question, which one is best? There are actually thousands of factory foremen present. In this case, it's our yellow factory foreman who's making the most protein. So let's give him the job. The question, the problem is, what if he only makes this amount of protein? This is the amount of protein he's used to making. What if that's not enough? What can we do about it? We can make him better using our technology. We can actually allow him to produce more protein, and that's important because that's more valuable. Another application of our technology is in uh, pathway optimization. In this case, there are multiple steps between the starting material and our desired product. Sometimes there are actually branches that, that essentially steal material out of our pathway from starting material to desired product to make some other product. Using our ability to optimize uh, promoters, we can actually improve the amount of the, of the uh, proteins that we want to essentially increase the amount of starting material converted to desired product while reducing the amount of uh, side product produced to either very low or essentially zero. So the circular solution is to find better promoters. We can do it quickly. We can do it comprehensively by essentially looking at millions of variant promoters at once to find the best ones. We can also do it in any organism and any cell type. And we've actually done this. Uh, we've, this is an expression of a very commonly used protein called the green fluorescent protein. Um, what I'd like you to do is concentrate what's on what's in this red oval. Okay, if you look at the, the purple band at the top, you'll notice that there's a lot, it's a lot more intense than the purple band at the far left. The, the, that purple band is how much protein is made by the natural promoter. This is the, the, what's known as the T7 promoter. It's a very commonly used promoter. It's been used for over 30 years in E. coli for protein production. 
And you can actually see that our cells are making more protein because you can see the increased glow. In little more than two weeks, we were able to, to find a better promoter that produces be between two and three times more protein than the natural promoter. So we've already um, <clears throat> deployed our bacterial system. We've shown that our system works in animal cells. Uh, within the, by the end of the year, we expect to have a, a proof of concept experiments in fungal and plant cells, and we'll begin marketing uh, this, our systems to potential customers. We actually already have deals in the works with Symergen and Evolva. So we have a lean business model. We're going to start where we are, which is improving protein production. It's a simple process where we'll adjust the strength of the promoter to produce the maximum amount of protein. Next, we're going to move on to uh, platform optimization. That's that process where we have multiple steps where we'll increase or decrease the strength of promoters to, to maximize the amount of starting material converted to product. At the same time, we're going to be using our technology to develop new uh, protein and chemical pr production platforms. Ultimately, we're going to use the revenue from those first three steps to develop our own products using our own promoters, our own platforms, and the information that we've developed to make our own products, our own high-value products, more efficiently than anyone else. So we only have one direct competitor, Synpromix out of the UK. Our technology is superior. We can, do, we can directly find promoters. We can optimize promoters at, with 10 to 100 times more variance in one step than they can. And we can, once we find the promoters, we can examine different conditions in which they're active in one step. Because we have a superior technology, we've had strong interest from these companies that we've talked to. Each of these companies has wanted to do a project with us, which is a little overwhelming, but is also so cool because people want to use our technology. Uh, we can address 200 and roughly $215 billion worth of markets, uh, predominantly a $100 billion market in biologics, where protein production is very important, and another $100 billion market in uh, animal, plant, and microbial uh, platforms uh, optimization. Our scientific team consists of myself, I'm a nucleic acid biochemist, my co-founder is Leanne Lindsay, who's our chief animal cell scientist, and Jim Lincoln, who is our chief plant and fungal uh, scientist. Uh, our uh, advisory boards uh, include uh, people with experience in protein production. Um, <clears throat> uh, startups and in business development. Our intellectual property is secure. We have two provisional patents filed last year that uh, cover our core technologies. We're currently raising $1.5 million in seed funding, which will allow us to uh, build the teams necessary to fully deploy our, uh, our platforms. If you're interested, please come and see us afterwards uh, and uh, come and see our glowing bacteria. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ryan Powell, and I'm here to talk to you about simple and scalable cell therapy. Now, every human starts as a single cell, which then grows and divides into more than 37 trillion cells. If something goes wrong during that process, and the cell begins to grow and divide uncontrollably, then you get cancer. Layla here has an amazing story. She was born with an untreatable blood cancer known as acute lymphoblastic leukemia. After the doctors tried everything, they, in they infused her with Genome edited cells from another patient, and those cells reversed her cancer. Now, this is great for Layla, but there are literally millions of people dying every year who could use those genome edited cells. So let's take a step back. In order to engineer one of these cells, you need a functional molecule like CRISPR-Cas9, and you need to deliver that molecule across the cell membrane and into the cytosol. Right now, there are two big ways to do this. One, by inducing a pore using a technology called electroporation, or two, with a, with a vector such as a virus. 
Now, dying patients are getting turned down by hospitals because the manufacturing scale of these therapeutics is limited to thousands of patients per year. So manufacturing these therapeutics at scale is the problem. If you look at cancer alone, 8.2 million people die every year. So here's what key opinion leaders have to say about viruses and electroporation. Calamune is developing an anti-HIV cell therapy using viruses, and Westmead Hospital is the largest bone marrow transplant in the Asia-Pacific region. Calamune needs a user-friendly way to do this, and the director of that hospital uses electroporation, but thinks there are no good options here at present. So our microfluidics represent the ideal solution. These devices can be manufactured at scales of 10 million per year, which is more than enough for the 8.2 million people who die every year of cancer, and orders of magnitude greater than the current manufacturing scale with viruses or electroporation. So here's how it works. You mix your molecules and your cells in suspension, you flow them through our device, and on the outlet, you get your molecules inside of your cells. So we use features that are one-tenth to one-one-hundredth the size of a human hair, and we flow our cells and molecules past them at more than 100 miles an hour. Our patent-pending fluid dynamics then disrupt the cell membrane, allowing for molecule delivery. We started IndieBio with an idea and some basic proof-of-concept data. Since then, we've gone on to demonstrate delivery with long-term immune model survival, and are even generating the Cas9 protein inside these cells, which is similar to the, which is a proof of concept for the therapeutics that were used to reverse Layla's cancer. So we're not the only ones working on this problem, and here's how we stack up against our competitors. Squeeze Biotech also uses microfluidics, but our yield is five-fold greater. Our cell viability is nearly double. Now that's important. You don't need a lot of cells, according to Professor Carl June, or the godfather of adoptive immunotherapy, but you do need enough to induce a therapeutic effect. And if you infuse cells with less than 80% viability, regulators won't like that. Why? Because you can cause an adverse immune response. We've also found that the market likes Lonza's electroporation system, but we aren't worried about that because our numbers are better. So here's our plan. Right now we're optimizing our delivery technology and then we're moving towards gene editing. At the same time, we're also focused on a cloud lab or lab automation as that will allow us to turn out high volumes of data. After that, we're focused on partner deals and then we'll move towards an FDA device master file, which means we'll be able to manufacture these therapeutics for the clinic. We have a substantial competitive advantage. We have a PCT filing. Our, our technology is scalable. We can make more than 10 million devices a year with existing manufacturing capabilities. We have high margins. Our chips cost less than $20 to make at an R&D scale, and it costs more than $6,000 for enough viruses just to treat one patient. We've also minimized risk. I use medical materials and approved suppliers, and we also have proprietary quality control software. So here's our business model. Our expertise and the highest margins lie in therapeutic development. We anticipate about $20 million per, in development milestone payments for each target. On the back of that, we hope to get about at least $30 million per rare disease in device sales alone. Now, every cell consists of an intracellular environment that's surrounded by a phospholipid bilayer or cell membrane. That means we can access any market that utilizes cells, including industrial and agricultural biotech. So here's our traction. We're talking to multiple big pharma companies with market capitalizations up to $200 billion. We're talking to two large gene editing companies, and we're also talking to a profitable cell, care, cell therapies company plus a big ag biotech company. Now, we can't put their names on there because we respect our confidentiality agreements. However, we're at the evaluation stage with a few of them. So here's our team. Matt is a weapon. He's got more than 10 years of experience in cell biology and disease modeling, and I specialize in microfluidics and medical devices. We're backed by a, a series of advisors, much who've been providing advice and mentorship for over half a decade. Also, some of them specialize in billion-dollar outcomes. Todd Martin, for example, helped draft and prosecute the $1.35 billion Mickelson patent portfolio, and Mike Bowles led a startup to a $3 billion IPO after just two and a half years. So thank you very much for your time. We've already raised more than half a million dollars, but we look forward to talking to anybody who is support, willing to support our efforts. co-founder of Girlette, 
we are developing technologies to measure and understand your immune system. So before I go into details, let me ask you all a question. How do you know you're healthy? Think about this. There is no objective measure of health. You may feel good, but the idea here is can we use data to actually drive this effort? And this is the question we are at, we are addressing at Gulet. The problem is what do you measure? DNA. So lots of effort was spent in sequencing the human genome and in sequencing technologies, but the and companies like 23andMe are founded on this idea. But the problem is DNA is a very static measurement and is set at birth. It's not reflective of your experiences, your lifestyle, etc. RNA and proteins are dynamic measurements but are different in different parts of your body. So therefore, the, for example, so if you want to address parts of your brain or your heart, etc., you cannot really access them and solve problems. The other approach is the omics approach, and this approach takes all of these measurements into consideration, but this is highly costly, time-consuming, and cannot be applied on a population scale. So our approach is to measure your immune system. Your immune system is constantly surveying you in all parts of your body. It's highly dynamic. It's, it changes based on what you eat, your lifestyle, your infections, etc. So we want to tap into the system, and each of you possess this highly dynamic system inside you. So we developed this core technology called T-Seq. And what T-Seq does is basically it measures two components of your immune system, the T-cells and the B-cells. Bl your blood sample contains millions of different B-cells and T-cells. And each of these cells have two unique barcodes on them. So upon infection, one of these cells multiplies and increases in number. And our technology deep sequences all of these immune signatures and gives you this profile. So for example, if you develop cancer, your immune system is the first one to see the tumor cells. And if we were to see this immune system, we can then see these tumors much early on. Not only that, it can also help differentiate different symptoms. So for example, if you're given a drug to treat cancer and you develop fever, the doctor doesn't understand if it's because you're developing allergy to the drug or is it because of some other inflammation. If we understand the immune system, we can tease out all these different signals. Our core technology, T-Seq, while it gives us valuable information, we can only tease out patterns of health if we develop this over thousands of people and develop this database called Immunomap. And that's exactly what we are trying to do at Gulet. Our competitor, Adaptive, they just raised $100 million based on a technology that's inferior, biased, does not allow for discovery, and is unvalidated. So we are super confident that we can easily break through this market. So we, we want to build a billion dollar company with little investment. So what we're doing is we are releasing our core technology, TSEQ, to researchers and clinicians who want the data just by themselves for various scientific questions. But this will also feed our Immunomap database. And once this database is growing, we want to then license this to pharma companies. And eventually, once we understand the dynamic components of this database, we want to release it and take this to the public. It's only 2016. And this just started, and we've already raised purchase orders worth 350K, and this number is just growing. And our customers include FDA, Columbia, and many other prominent universities. And we've started some amazing collaborations with clinicians at UCSF in Oslo and many other companies that's interested in working with us. We are raising money because we want to accelerate the process of the Immunomap database, open a clear lab so we can start processing clinical samples. Ravi and I are proud founders of Gurlet. He is an expert in sequencing and has built many big data sets and can analyze them very efficiently. Together, we've built many sequencing technologies, patented them, exclusively licensed. And the third one is the basis of Gurlet. We are backed by strong investors and an amazing scientific advisory board, a dedicated team, and we are all set and determined to create a change. I'm excited to announce we just closed our seed round, but we are always open to interested and interesting partnerships, so please come talk to us, and I look forward to talking to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, and thank you, everyone. I'm Henrik, and I'm going to tell you about Truth Neuroimaging.
At Troost, we are making a cloud-based software service that dramatically increases what we can see in the brain. Our product transforms the existing install base of EEG equipment and enables true biomarkers for the first time. So the problem that we are addressing is that brain disorders and brain disease pose a huge challenge that is likely to affect most of us. And up until now, we've really been unable to do much about it because we don't understand the brain. But why don't we understand the brain? Well, the main reason is that because we can't see it, we can't actually study it. We can't understand what we can't see. There's a huge blank space in the map of what we can see with different neuroimaging techniques, because none of them have high resolution in both time and space. And the true functional window to the brain lies in this blank space. The consequence is that the cost of brain-related health problems is enormous, and it's growing at a catastrophic rate. This translates into a neuroimaging market, which is already of the order of billions. So how can we reduce this cost and capture a large part of the market? We've had the key insight that current EEG analysis throws away most of the available information as if it was noise. We have, however, figured out how to treat the recorded data as a compressed hologram and computationally search for the best decompression with the least noise. In general, a very difficult problem with many local minima, but one that we can transform into a much simpler optimization problem using prior knowledge of the brain. The result is a true functional window to the living dynamic brain. So let's take a first look through this window. This is a video of our second generation prototype visualizing electromagnetic energy flow in the brain at unprecedented resolution and detail. Energy flow is a completely new measure that directly reveals how different areas influence each other. Because if energy is flowing from A to B, it means that A is influencing B. And this is something that is actually there. It's not based on statistics, as is currently done. This new view of the brain will greatly help us understand it. And people love it, even the experts. It's not only useful, it's also quite beautiful. And just to highlight, that this is a dynamic view, here's what happens when we show a picture of a face to a participant. You can compare this to the conventional source analysis of the same data. It's static, it's low information, and it's a simple mapping onto a generic brain model. Clearly, the information content here is orders of magnitude above anything ever seen before. And it immediately raises the question, now that we can see it, what are we going to do with it, and how is it going to change the world? <laughs> Imagine that these images represent what we've been able to see in the brain up till now. We can't really make sense of them, and neither can computers. What we have done corresponds to doing this taking the information quality to the level where even computers are able to recognize and caption what are in the images. This is a real machine learning example from Stanford. So what we are proposing is to do the same thing for our energy flow imaging, automatically discovering biomarkers for brain-related health problems. That means early diagnosis of Alzheimer's, localization of epileptic focal points, diagnosis of autism, and tracking of concussions and traumatic brain injuries, and so on. And we can take this even further, revealing not only what is there, but also where it is, which is really important in the brain. So, we envision a future with an EEG cloud terminal in every doctor's office as a natural part of every physical. And the doctor doesn't even have to be an EEG expert when using our biomarker assistant. To get to this point, we are partnering with key opinion leaders in high-profile research labs. And we are on track 
to deliver a solution tailored to specific conditions of high impact by the end of the year. From that point, we'll switch to the cloud so that we can scale and deploy quickly through existing channels. This software service will be the focal point of all data that pass through it, including historical data. And it will allow us to set up a positive feedback loop whereby data mining generates relevance for more people, which in return generates more data to mine, and so on. Ultimately, making EEG biomarkers relevant for general population health. Our team is myself and my co-founder Lars, and between us, we have many of the skills needed, all across neuroscience, physics, design, and engineering. But to fully implement our vision, we need to expand our team. And for that purpose, we are raising an initial seed round of $2 million. Thank you. Are you guys ready to eat? OK, OK, let's wait for the slides. Good afternoon. My name is Uma Valeri. I'm the CEO of Memphis Meats. We're making delicious meats safer, better, and healthier for you, the planet, and the animals. We are a group of health experts, scientists, and culinaries that came together to transform an industry that's badly in need of it. Looking back at the history of meat, Man first domesticated wild animals 12,000 years ago, and we, all the animals we eat now have come from that process. And this has led to a global love for meat across the world. Every culture and every country, the majority of people eat meat. In fact, 90% of the world's population eats meat. However, this demand is not sustainable, and the meat industry knows that. There are three main problems with the current meat production techniques. Number one, there's a scarcity of resources. The demand for meat is doubling in the next 30 years, and there's not enough resources to meet the demand. Number two, the health risks with meat are substantial. Did you know that the amount of feces that Americans eat in their meat every day is staggering in their meat? I didn't know that. And if you think about the number of antibiotics that are pumped into animals, this leads to antibiotic resistance, and also sets the stage for diseases like the bird flu that we hear about every year, or swine flu. And lastly, a very important reason that makes this inherently inefficient for meat, produ meat, meat production as we do it now, because it takes 23 calories of grain to make one calorie of beef. Now, that's not sustainable. Behind these challenges lies the world's greatest opportunity for us. And what we're doing is by starting with growing pork and beef into delicious meats that we're all used to eating, and targeting the 500 billion market opportunity in the US and Europe. This is how it works. We identify the best quality animals, cows and pigs, and we take cells, meat cells, from let's say a pork shoulder or a top sirloin. We identify cells that are capable of self-renewal, and we cultivate them using our Memphis meats techniques in a clean and safe environment to make meat delicious, and we harvest it. If we want tender cuts of meat, we harvest them very early. If we want more texturized meat, we harvest it later. So we've learned that the techniques that we're planning to employ in growing these meat, porks and beef initially, are incredibly efficient. We're going to use three calories of energy input to make one calorie of pork or beef. And also think about it. It takes 12 to 20 months to raise a beef cattle before it's slaughtered for making a meatball, and we made that in two to three weeks. You're looking at the actual beef cells growing on our cell farm. And if you look at these large muscle fibers, they have lots of nuclei in there, and it looks identical to the meat that you'd find from a slaughtered animal. No difference at any level. Now this tells us that we're at a paradigm change in the history of the world. We're calling this the second domestication, because we're domesticating cells to grow meat and not domesticating animals to slaughter them to make meat. 
We're also very careful about how our meat can be better than what's available now. Now, bacterial contamination of meat is a serious food safety concern. So what we did last week was our intern walked to the grocery stores, an organic grocery store locally in San Francisco and a conventional grocery store, and we also gave him the pork and beef that we grew at Memphis Meats, and we put them on these plates, these two plates you're seeing behind me. And if you look at the fuzzy lines in the top right and the bottom right, that's pork and beef that we took from the organic store and the conventional store, and those fuzzy lines are bacteria growing within 24 hours. And if you look on the left-hand side, where you see the Memphis meats, pork and beef, there is no bacteria because we're growing it in a pathogen-free environment. And this has significant safety implications. Now let me show you how our meat cooks and how it handles. Here's a chef who came in from LA, a professional chef, that came and rolled our meatball and rolled it around in a pan 10 days ago. We heard the meat sizzle and filled the room with the aroma of a great Italian meatball. And we had an independent taster who came by, and her reaction was very candid. It tastes like a meatball. It's good. It's more. <laughs> yeah, this is good. <laughs> Thank you. At this point, we had to jump and stop her from eating the whole meatball, because <laughs> there were many others in the room who wanted a little bite of that meatball. So. <laughs> We're also very cost conscious. We knew that techniques used in academic laboratories cost a significant amount when this burger was grown two years ago by a scientist from the Netherlands. It cost $330,000 for a 100 gram burger. We've already lowered that cost by 100 times and dropping it rapidly. Here's our path to market entry. We are going to use our seed financing to really identify the best quality of cells that can self-renew themselves and also develop the nutrient-rich medium and the food that we feed these cells. Just like a, a, a great beef uh, a steak is grown from a beef that eats the best grass available, we're going to feed our cells also the best plant-based ingredients available and make them grow into meat that we all love. We subsequently are going to use our techniques to scale up, to go to production scale, so that we can start off with meat chefs who actually know how to cook the meat and make it tasty. And we want to be in restaurants, in some specialty restaurants, within three years, and subsequently scale it up based on their feedback so we can be in retail within five years. We've been very fortunate to have incredible coverage from the Wall Street Journal and many other media outlets this week. And we've been humbled, excited, thrilled from the global response for people waiting for the Memphis Meats products. It's a small poll here, but 15,000 people were polled by an independent individual named Sam Harris on Twitter, and 83% of them said they'll absolutely switch to our products if it's identical to meat, and we are making meat. So we also had this video that we released that went viral with about 4 million hits as of this morning, growing by a million every day. And we're just hitting a nerve because the world, I believe, sincerely is ready for reinventing how we eat meat and so should the meat industry. Here's our team that's going to make this a reality. We are, we are hiring brilliant people with brilliant hearts and minds to really make this their purpose because there is a very big reward here for many reasons. I'm a cardiologist, you met me, and my focus is really to laser focus our team to make it better, safer, and healthier for all of us. My co-founder, Nick Genovese, is an academic skeletal muscle biologist who's dedicated his career to grow meat from cells, and he's our head meat farmer. Uh, we also have a third co-founder who's unique in his own way, Will Clem, a tissue engineer, who also is a third-generation barbecue restaurant owner from Memphis. <laughs> and his family and extended family own 43 barbecue restaurants. And he's incredibly excited about handling this meat and can't wait to try his recipes. We also have Morgan, who's a phenomenal food scientist from Davis, who can make anything taste edible and great. And I want to have a shout out for David Kay, our marketing intern from Stanford, who's been handling all the media attention we didn't plan for or expect, but very grateful for. We have a phenomenal advisory board with deep science experience, experience in bioreactor development, food formulation, and developing sustainable food policy. So we are delighted that you're all here to witness this amazing event of all our companies talking to you about our dreams. 
And we're humbled to announce that we've closed our oversubscribed seed round at $2.75 million. And we're looking to talk to anyone who wants to partner with us. You, if you have a deep science background, apply for a job. If you have partnership ideas, call us. And if you're an investor and want to come to Series A, talk to us. Or if you want to sample our products, come and talk to us. You can eat the best quality pork and beef you've ever had in your life. Thank you very much. All right, uh, that's 14. Um, I'm a bit bewildered. It's, I mean, I've been working with these guys for four months, and, and this is a pretty emotional moment uh, for, I think, uh, me and, and the entire team and, and all the teams back here. Uh, I'm just super impressed with how far they've all come, uh, with how hard they've all worked, and, uh, and I'm just very proud to be able to share this all with you today. So thanks, uh, thanks again to all the teams. Let's give them a round of applause. I'd also like to bring up Sean O'Sullivan, uh, the man with the vision and the uh, courage to make all this happen. I think that's one of the things that is important here. It is, it is about courage to take on technical risk, uh, to take on risks that, that would enable companies like this to go on and change the world. Uh, and, and it's amazing to see Sean be able to do that. Uh, go ahead. Well, uh, it's not me. It's obviously the incredible IndieBio team. I guess the the leap of faith that we all uh, took today in coming here was, you know, can, can scientists with just a few hundred thousand dollars in backing uh, really, and these incredible ideas, uh, you know, have the kind of progress that they're, they're having today? We can, we can see that some of those dreams are becoming reality. It's, it's quite, uh, quite astonishing to, to me. Um, I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer. So I don't know how many of you guys are just blown away by the, the science that we've just learned in the last hour and a half, two hours. Um, these things just seem like, you know, impossible dreams, and they're happening. And so, uh, you know, I, I want to encourage all of you to, to recognize we're at a very unique time in the planet's history. Um, I, actually, just a year and a half ago when we had our first Indie Bio Demo Day, there were 50 uh, people in the room today. There were over, and we had to drag them in off the street. Um, and today there were over a thousand people that were, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, accept everybody on the wait list uh, to come uh, here today. And over 280 investors uh, that are in the audience uh, today, not to mention, I'm sure, uh, many hundreds or thousands on the on this live cast of this event. So, so it is a remarkable moment in time that we're all at that these kind of fundamental changes are within our, within our grasp. And so for those of you with the power to influence some of this change that we want to see in society, for those of you that want to be part of this, please help back these incredible entrepreneurs who have come, as, as uh, they, they talked about, from eight or nine different countries, from 16 different research institutes, from, you know, from lifetimes of, of study of science, and let's make these dreams uh, a little bit more real. Open up your checkbooks and open up your hearts. Uh, uh, and let's, let's make these things uh, real as quickly as we can. Thank you very much for coming today. Another shout out for... Just some logistics. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and, and open up. Uh, feel free to stay uh, for, for quite a while. Uh, in the beginning, we're going to move the ropes over and uh, just for investors and press, to meet the teams then, right away. And then later on, we'll open it up for everyone. So if, you, if you hang out, uh, once investors and press have talked to the teams, we'll open it up and you can actually meet the, the incredible founders that we have here today. And uh, again, a special thanks to Ryan and Ron, uh, whom Ron, Ron is somewhere around here, but uh, with, without whom we couldn't do this at all. And just one other logistical note, uh, I'm not sure if you saw it, uh, if you, uh, but it's demoday.indiebio.co if you want to reach out to any of the people here. It's all the email addresses, all the Twitter, all the LinkedIn profiles. Uh, so if you want to reach out to any of those uh, people, HTTP 
HT, what is it? Uh, P, it's, 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 TTP it's, colon it's, slash slash. It's demoday.indiebio.co, right? So demoday.indiebio.co, I like pitching. So I'm always good to, to sell. Uh, just to, another quick note, I, I really wanted to thank the entire community. So all of our partners, all of the investors, all of the people that come and help and mentor all of the teams. It really takes a village to, to make this happen. And so, so we have an incredible village here. It's a global village because we've had help from around the world. And so we just wanted to thank them. We also wanted to thank our teammates, obviously Ron, who we can't find yet, uh, Manana, um, you, Alex, and many, many other people that made this happen. So thank you very much, everyone. And, uh, and now we're going to be hanging out for another two hours or so. Well, you can hang out. Yeah. Yeah, hang out as long as you want um, until they kick us all out. Yeah. But uh, yeah, thanks again for coming and uh, enjoy your time. <laughs>